You're listening to the Sunday podcast from Life Point Church in Santan Valley, Arizona. We hope you are encouraged by today's message. For more information, visit us online at lifepointaz.com. Good morning. We have new lights, can you tell? <laughs> yeah, so this past week, uh, a few of us uh, were in here pulling down the old fixtures, putting up the new ones. Um, not only is it brighter, it's easier for them to control back there. It works better, and they're LED, so they're going to cost just a little bit less. Uh, so um, now, Pastor Nathan was perfectly fine with David Noel and Mike Schamberg, our, our youth pastor, being in here. But when he saw me doing electrical wiring, I think he called the fire department. I'm, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, yeah, but, but yeah. Uh, but they all work. So um, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, this morning, we're wrapping up John's Gospel, and, and, and when you study John's Gospel, you can see why some churches spend, we've been in it for about a year, some churches will spend two or three years in just in John's Gospel, um, because there is so much uh, in there. But today, we're going to be in John 21. We're talking about four verses, 15 through 19. And in those four verses, uh, I, I really could be up here for at least an hour explaining just some of the things that, that, that are entailed in those four verses, but um, we won't. Um, we'll just be up here for a little bit. But if you would turn with me to John chapter 21, verses 15 through 19. If you don't have a Bible, uh, there should be one nearby you in a seat, uh, in front of you, under you. Uh, if you don't own a Bible, please take that. It is our gift to you. Uh, you're not stealing. They're for you. So, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. When you were old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he said to him, follow me. This is the word of our Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your son Jesus. Thank you for revealing in your word how we can be in communion with you and restore our relationship with you. Thank you for the sacrifice of your son Jesus on the cross. And it's always empty me of anything that is me and that this message is, is you 100%. Send your spirit to open minds and moving hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So if you remember uh, from last week, the end of John chapter 20 in verse 30 and 31, uh, where, where John gives us the entire meaning for his whole gospel. And he says, uh, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. It's not an exhaustive history. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The end. Right? I mean, the end would kind of fit there. It kind of seems like a good way to end. But there's another chapter. We have chapter 21. And chapter 21, you got, <laughs> Scripture is awesome, right? It... it, it, it it surprises us every time. When you really study it and you dig in, it, it, there's a reason it's called the living word, right? It, it comes alive. Um, and the scholars and, and theologians will disagree somewhat on chapter 21, um, but it, was, it's in, uh, it is ascribed to John. John wrote it. And the reason for chapter 21 is a little bit different than the rest of his gospel. So why does it end there? Why, why is it? not the end at, at chapter, or verse 31. Chapter 21 is an epilogue. It's, a, it's a, not a postscript that says something different. It's an epilogue that kind of brings things together. And in this epilogue, unlike the rest of John's gospel, it is not written for unbelievers. Chapter 21 is written for the church. 
And it outlines some of our responsibilities and the work that is to be done by the church. This brings me to my first point. We are more than the sum of our mistakes, and Jesus will use you in spite of them. And if there was ever a better example than Peter, I don't know who it is because, um, well, let's just look at what Peter's done. So a few months ago, if you remember in John 13, when, when Jesus is washing the feet of his disciples and he's talking to John, and he wash, or Peter, and he washes Peter's feet, and he's, no, oh, no, no, Lord, Lord, wash all of me. And again, I just imagine Jesus just sitting back going, dude, you just don't get this. No, I don't need to wash all of you, right? And then we'll get to his three denials. But then we see uh, in Matthew 16, which is awesome because this is when Peter is rebuked by Jesus. What's awesome about the a few verses before this, Jesus says, Peter, on your confession, I'm going to build my whole church. That you've, Peter confesses that Jesus is the Lord. I'm going to build my church on that. Here are the, kings, the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Like three verses later, when Jesus is telling the disciples he's going to die, Peter says, no, 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 Lord, we would never let that happen to you. Jesus, I rebuke you. You are a stumbling block to me, Peter. I'm going to give you the keys. You're a stumbling block to me. What? Peter, and then, and then we unpack Peter's denial of Christ three times. So the first time is uh, a servant girl is talking to him, and he says no. The second time um, is uh, the Pharisees, some other Pharisees, and people are asking him if he knows Jesus. He says no. And keep in mind, this happens within very quick succession. He's standing over a fire, a charcoal fire, and there's a whole lot of symbolism in that. Um, But he's standing over a fire, keeping warm, and people keep coming up and asking him. Well, the third time, the person who asks him if he knows Jesus is the guy is a relative of the guy who Peter cut his ear off. So it's like his cousin or his brother. Now Peter has a golden opportunity here to glorify Jesus because he put his ear back on, nothing short of miraculous, and he has an opportunity to glorify him. But if we look to Matthew's gospel, we see how frustrated Peter is with these questions because in Matthew chapter 26, it says that he called down curses and swore at them. I do not know this guy. Expletive, expletive, expletive. This is the guy that Jesus just told he's going to build his church on his confession, that he's going to be a great leader in the church. He's going to be a fisherman. He's going to be... Peter made some grave and serious mistakes, up to and including denying Christ. But Scripture tells us after the third denial and he hears the rooster crow... And he immediately reminds him of Jesus' prediction. He knows what happened, and he walks away demoralized, depressed. He weeps. He is, he is regretful. He is in a place of self-contempt. He's just not in a good place, knowing full well what he had just done. But just as he denied Christ three times, Christ had to restore him three times to reinstate him into the ministry for which he was called, that Jesus knew beforehand, before Peter even was called, in the beginning, Jesus knew this was Peter's mission. But Peter had to be reinstated because of his, his essentially of his guilt. If he would have gone out and, and done ministry, it could have been like an act of penance, right? Oh, well, I messed up these three times. I've got to go fix it. I've got to do all these things to make it right. But that's not the gospel. So Jesus knows that's Peter's heart. And he's going to go and restore Peter three times just as Peter denied him three times. Because he could have wallowed in his self-pity, his self-contempt, depression, But Jesus didn't want that. He wanted his ministry to be done with a rejoicing heart. He didn't want his ministry to be done out of some penitent belief. The cool thing is that, and this is my second point, Jesus will, can and will, restore broken people to be leaders in his church to care for his sheep. Every time that Jesus asks him, do you love me, Peter? 
He follows it up with an action. Jesus is saying, okay, go do this. Feed my sheep. Feed my lambs. Feed my, uh, care for my sheep. In the Greek, those, those three terms for lamb and the two terms for sheep are different kinds of sheep. New believers, established believers, and believers that aren't discipling so well. So Jesus is giving him an action list of things that he needs to do. He needs to feed his sheep. He's giving him, because he knows that there is work to be done. Peter has work to be done. And John, you know, John and Peter can sometimes seem a little competitive sometimes, and I imagine they kind of were. Um, but John, in writing his gospel, needs us as his readers of his church to see Peter restored. This guy who is hot-tempered, passionate to a fault, didn't really care for other people too well. Right? I mean, this is the guy. There's kingdom work to be done. And if you're sitting here and profess to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, we have been commissioned to do the work, the kingdom work here in this life. You see, if we look ahead to the book of Acts, we see Peter doing the work. He's preaching, he's, he's teaching, he's leading thousands of people to Christ He's commissioning others. We have the, the first deacon in the Bible, and Stephen, that Peter is preaching and says, hey, guys, I need somebody to go care for, for the flock. Uh, Stephen, you're good at this. You go do this. I've got to focus on preaching. What Jesus is saying with feed my sheep, care for my lamb, feed my sheep, is not what the rest of John's gospel says. He's not saying go out and share the gospel with non-believers. What he's saying is tend my flock. Care for the people in my church. Partly, I believe, because what kind of a witness are we if inside we have people who are hungry and naked and we're not feeding them and we're not clothing them? And these are our brothers and sisters. This is direction for the church saying, no, 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 I've told you for 20 chapters, go out and spread the gospel and absolutely still do that. But you need to care for each other. Feed my sheep. Care for my flock. We are to tend to love and protect the body of Christ. That is the church. And we do this with our time, our treasure, and our talent, right? The, the cliche statement. But it's not cliche, it's truth. This is what Jesus is saying. It's almost like Jesus' love language is acts of service, right? <laughs> Peter, if you love me as much as you think you do, I want you to do these things. Peter, if you love me as much as you think you do, feed my sheep, tend to my flock. Peter needed to hear that. And Jesus knew that. We needed to hear it. John knew that. Which is why this epilogue to the entire Gospel of John is there. What's awesome is how Jesus upholds us. And we're going to back up to the beginning of chapter 21 and I'm going to go over some things. But my third point is if we truly love Jesus... Not just follow him and his teachings. Not, but if we truly love Jesus, we must demonstrate it. Faith without works is dead. And knowing it's going to be difficult, we are not in control, and it could cost us our lives. See, in the first part of John 21 is actually pretty awesome because Jesus, if you, this is the resurrected Jesus, is standing on the shore calling out to the disciples who are fishing. You see, Peter's gone back to his work. He's gone back to the day-to-day -day mundane work that he had to do as a fisherman. He's gone back. And Jesus is standing on the shore. The resurrected Christ is standing on the shore going, hey, guys, you caught any fish? The disciples are like, no. Nah. Hey, throw your net over that side. You'll catch a bunch. And they do. The hall is 153 fish, and there is, you can stand up here for an hour talking about the 153, so I'd encourage you to dig into that a little bit yourselves. But, it was such a big catch that scholars and historians believe it probably took two boats to bring it in. And what's awesome is at this point, they don't even recognize it's Jesus. He is providing for them. He is telling them where to fish, where to gather. 
And they don't even know it's him yet. And then John says, that's our Lord. And of course, Peter, as Peter does, extremely zealous, jumps in the water and swims to the shore. <laughs> Which, again, if, if you know anything, if you read anything about Peter's character, that fits him to a T. But Jesus is directing the catch. Jesus is directing their way. Jesus is championing their work without them even knowing it. But how often, if we're honest, how often does the work, does our work get in the way of feeding the sheep and caring for the lambs? How often do we allow the business of every day to overshadow Jesus' command to care for his his church, to tend the body of Christ? And as the sheep, how often do we allow our day-to-day to stop us from being fed, to stop us from being discipled. Jesus is saying, I got you. I'm going to provide for you in ways that you can't even imagine that you don't even know it's me. But there is work to be done. As we see again in Acts they, they traveled, the disciples traveled, they preached the gospel, they shared the gospel, they planted churches, they called others. In Romans 7, 7, 6, it says, we have been released from the law so that we can serve in the way of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 1, 26, we are called. 1 Corinthians 2, 9, we are to be co-workers in God's service, the church. And I love this. In Ephesians 2, 10, We have a gifting, a calling, and work, kingdom work to be done. And it was put in on us before we even knew who Jesus was. Peter will make you a great fisher of men. Peter, you're going to be a pastor. Peter, you're going to lead my church. Peter, you have made a ton of mistakes, and you may not really get it entirely, but I'm going to put you in a place of leadership. That is such good news, especially for people like me. Um, That, you know, we are, again, we're not the sum of our mistakes. This This is the gospel in a nutshell. Jesus is saying, dude, I know you've messed up. Do you love me? Of course I do. Great. I'm gonna give you work to do. Because his heart is in the right place. His brain, not always, but his heart is. And if you're sitting there right now thinking that God can't use you or God doesn't want you because of some of the stupid things or the mistakes you've made in your past, that is not true. This is a guy who denied Christ flat out and swore at the people who was asking him about Jesus. And he turns out to be one of the greatest leaders in the church. He writes part of the New Testament. It includes laying down our lives, and that's how John ends it, is he talks about how Peter is going to die, that you're going you're to do these things, you're going to go out, I've reinstated you to your position, you're going to go out and do all these things, and it's going to cost you your life. And this is where skeptics say that, you know, how, I don't understand how they can get to the point that saying this isn't true or that Jesus wasn't God. These men and more and more and more people, thousands, by this time in history, billions of people have given their lives in service to Jesus. And so what we know about Peter's death, um, there's so much just wrapped up in here, but it, it's, Jesus is telling him he's going to give his life and then explains to him how he's going to die. See, when he says you're going to be clothed, the word there in the Greek means Bound. And Peter, as far as historians can tell, may have been crucified upside down. He was definitely crucified, but he wasn't pierced and nailed to the cross like Jesus was because he didn't think he was worthy of that. He was bound to the cross. Fits his character. He's going to be led in places he doesn't want to go. Jesus is going to call him out of his comfort zone to go into the world, preach the gospel, and tend to his flock. So, <clears throat> what does this practically look like for us? Because right? I'm not 
saying this to guilt trip you. This is, this is inspiration that no matter how broken we are, God wants to use us and we have been commissioned to do work. So what does this practically look like? I want to tell you a story. I'm going to call the band back out if they can hear me. Now, in first and second service, I've gotten a little choked up telling you this story, so if it happens, I'm just warning you. <laughs> so there's a, there's a woman in our congregation who uh, a few weeks ago was in New York City on business, doing some work. And as people who in New York City do, you eat pizza, right? Because it's like the best pizza in the world. Um, so they're eating pizza, and, and again, I don't have all the details perfect. This literally just happened this week. Um, but as God does with messages, is, is this, it fits unbelievably well. So she meets this guy at the pizza place. He's a homeless guy. Um, he's begging for money uh, and obviously high. And she hears God saying, pray for him. I want, I want you to pray for him. And she doesn't. She tries to give him money. He drops it. I guess she, he couldn't pick it up because he was so high. But she knew in her heart that God was commanding her to pray for this man at this time, and she did not do it. So she flies back to Phoenix. And over the next few weeks, she's praying and overwhelmingly hearing God saying, I need you to pray for him. You need to pray for him. And it's like most Christians do. We're like, okay, well, cool. I'll pray for him. God, have, you know. and Jesus, God says, no, 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 no. I want you to go back to New York City and pray for this man in person. So she prays with her husband and they come to agreement. <laughs> Thanksgiving night, she books a ticket to New York City, no hotel, no nothing. She's gonna go there for one day to find one homeless guy in a city of 8.6 million people. No plan. And what she does is just goes back to the same pizza place looking for him. He's not there. As she's walking out, she hears the Lord tell her to go to this bus station. Go to the bus station, he'll be there. So she does, and he is. In a city of 8.6 million people, hundreds of thousands of homeless. Hey guys, throw your net that way. I'll provide the fish. So she prays for him. She's given the opportunity to pray for other people. And, and this, is, this is this much of this testimony. It's amazing. Um, she literally has the opportunity to feed people. There's a guy who needs $21 to get where he's going. And I think it was to his family who had cancer. She opens her wallet and has $21 in her wallet. This, this is not coincidence. This is supernatural action. She could have chosen to say, no, 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 God. You couldn't be calling me to do something this crazy. I just basically told you no. God, you couldn't be calling me. I've made so many other mistakes. God, I can't go. It costs too much money. It's Thanksgiving. Come on. But she didn't. She books a last-minute ticket on Thanksgiving weekend to fly across the country to pray for someone. See, we're going to make mistakes in this life as Christians. It's a guarantee. It's a promise. But we have been commissioned for work in this world, and our focus needs to be on feeding and caring for others. Let's pray. Father, you are awesome. You are amazing. Your abundant grace for us is so undeserved. I know it's there, I believe it's there, but man, I, I don't know why you do it for us. But thank you for loving us so much. 
Thank you for upholding us daily, for guiding us. You will never leave us or forsake us, and everything we do in your name is for good. You will show us where to go, and all you ask in return is love and trust. You're awesome. Amen. So, um, the person who that story was about is Heather Weger. Um, and her and I talked last night, and, and my sermon could not have ended a different way. It was, it was such a God thing, and she wasn't, didn't even give me full permission to put the story in here until last night. So, if she would have said no, the sermon would have ended a little bit different. But she just asked me if she could speak. She has a word. So, a couple um, like months ago, as I was praying, God gave me this word to pray over Life Point, and it was um, that Life Point would be spirit filled. And you know, I did I did go to New York, um, and I did step out in faith. But the story is not about me, and it's not for my glory. Um, it's only for the glory of God, and it's because. In this place, he is rising up believers who are going to go out and they're going to step out in faith and they're going to walk in faith and they're going to do great things in this place. And one of the things that God has been showing me lately and I've been praying is Psalm 27. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. So that's my prayer over life point because this isn't about me at all. It's not for my glory. It's not to feed my pride. I was just the vessel. But he's calling you to do that too. And he's calling us like it says in Hebrews 12. Um, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witness, witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. We have to get to that place where the one thing that we seek, that we chase after over everything else is the Lord and only the Lord, that we want to be in his presence that that's what we're seeking after, that's what we're striving after, where we get to the place where we say, I don't wanna walk in this anxiety and fear anymore. God, I I drop it all at your feet, Lord, and I'm gonna walk out in faith doing whatever you call me to do. If I'm walking and I hear a word for somebody while I'm walking, I'm gonna stop what I'm doing and I'm gonna speak this word of life over that person. Because when we, when we walk in boldness and we respond and we are in the word of God and we are in his presence and he is filling us up, you're gonna hear his voice and you're gonna look crazy. And if you don't look crazy, you're probably not walking in God. And it's time for Life Point to stand up and be a body of believers that is united, that we're not talking about other people in our church that we seek Jesus with all of our hearts and we walk in faith and we, we are walking forward with the power of the Holy Spirit within us. And we do bold and great things, but not because of our power, not for our glory, not for us to look good, but for Jesus Christ. God, I pray over this church, Lord. Raise your hands with me. Over this church, God, we pray that this would be a spirit-filled church, Lord. We pray that you would move in your people, God. We throw off the sin, everything that entangles us, God. We throw it down, Lord, and we only look to you. God, move in us. Show us what we can do for you, Lord. Speak to us. Prompt us. God, if we get it wrong the first time, let us have another chance in your people, God. Raise us up for you, Lord. You are so good. You are so good. Holy God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Who says women can't teach? Um, So we're going to share in communion. 
Uh, we have three stations in the front and three in the back. We are told when we go into communion, do not take it lightly. Get right with the Lord. If you are being held back by some sin or some mistake that you think you've made that is so bad that God doesn't want you, that is a lie. We have pastors, elders, and prayer partners up front who would love to pray with you, introduce you to Christ, talk to you about your walk with Christ, encourage you. But our only requirement for communion at LifePoint Church is that you have called on Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I'm going to be quiet for a minute. Would you please rise and, and get the elements? the night he was betrayed, Jesus sat with his disciples, sinners, broken men who made a bunch of mistakes. And he said, hey guys, every time you get together, I want you to break bread, to remember my body broken for you. Did you eat the bread? In a similar way, filled the cup and he lifted it, gave thanks to God and said, every time you gather, drink from the cup to remember my blood poured out to cover your sin. Drink. Father, words cannot, words cannot describe you your love for us, you're upholding us, you're guiding us, you're leading us, you're sustaining us, you're providing for us. The list is endless and none of it's deserved. Thank you for loving us so much that you sent your son Jesus to be ridiculed, humiliated, beaten, and killed for us. It is in his mighty name I pray.